you are ready. All right, welcome everyone um, to my talk on spiritualism, the female medium and Victorian and Edwardian ghost stories. Um, I'm really excited to just chat with you all at the end um, to see, you know, who is really familiar with spiritualism, um, ghost stories and mediums and seances and such. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly go over some points um, in my talk today. Um, so first, I will give a brief overview of spiritualism um, in the US and how it then shifted over um, into Britain. Um, some of you might be familiar with spiritualism, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, just for some of those who um, might not be familiar with it, I will go over that. Um, then we'll take a look at some real life um, female spiritualists um, in Victorian America and Britain, such as the Fox sisters, Florence Cook um, and Madame de Esperance. Um, then we'll shift toward looking at the interconnection between the female Gothic spiritualism and women's ghost stories. Um, that is the focus of my research. Um, in particular, I look at how the persecuted heroine who appears in Radcliffean novels in the early female Gothic transforms into this female spiritualist who has her own autonomy and authority and who um, really pushes back against patriarchal power and institutions. And so we'll be looking at this figure within four Victorian um, American and British ghost stories written by um, Rhoda Broughton, Edith Nesbitt, uh, Madeline Vinton Dahlgren, and Edith, um, and then Rose Terry Cook. And then we'll be looking at two um, Edwardian ghost stories by um, Edith Wharton and Bithia Marie, um, Mary Croker. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so spiritualism. Um, so spiritualism, just to give a really brief background, is a movement that believes in um, the communication between the living and the dead. So typically a medium is used to communicate to spirits um, in, the, in the afterlife. And um, this movement started in 1848 um, by the Fox sisters who I'll talk about in a little bit briefly. Um, so it was a really popular movement. Um, it also was um, based off of uh, writings from Emanuel Swedenborg, who wrote about um, the spiritual realm and world. Um, and that was really popular in upstate New York, um, those readings. And then also um, Franz Mesmer, who created and developed um, hypnotism, also known as mesmerism too. Um, so there was a lot of um, just interest in trying to contact um, with dead loved ones um, during the Victorian era, both in America and Britain. Um, there is a lot of death and a lot of loss, especially in America um, after the Civil War. Um, authors like Elizabeth Stuart Phelps um, wrote these novels and, and stories that were filled with spiritualist um, elements because they're trying to, you know, really come to terms with death in the afterlife and understanding this. Um, as most of us know, you know, during the Victorian era, there was so much technological change and discoveries. And so a lot of people who were followers of spiritualism were interested in just knowing what was in the afterlife and, and again, just trying to come to terms with death too. Also during this time, um, a lot of different participants within spiritualism um, occurred. So of course we have the Fox sisters who were mediums and performed um, in the private and public sphere, but we also have clairvoyants, um, trans speakers and automatic writers too. Um, and of course there were so many followers, um, a lot of different um, people would invite mediums into their home, into the private um, domestic sphere and have them perform seances and talk to spirits. But also a really other interesting participant within spiritualism were the skeptics themselves. Um, so, and I will talk about this briefly later. Um, there are different organizations that developed that were trying to probe and understand spiritualism and to see if it was actually real. Um, and so the Society for Cyclical Research was developed in Britain in 1882. Um, and so these were male, um, what, like, do I, what I like to call male occult investigators um, who would probe these female mediums and try all these different types of um, kind of crazy tests, like tying them down um, to see if they actually could embody um, and perform full form materializations of spirits. Um, so that's just a really brief overview of that. If you're really interested in diving more into spiritualism, I highly recommend reading um, Janet Oppenheim's The Other World. She does a really thorough in-depth um, analysis of spiritualism. Um, and Dinah, uh, 
Diana Basham's The Trial of Woman looks at the intersections of um, feminism and spiritualism. And then Alex Owens, The Darkened Room looks at spiritualism as well. So spiritualism did emerge um, in America in 1848 in Hydesville, New York um, with the Fox sisters, Katie and Maggie. So they are roughly about 14 and 11, um, which is really kind of um, interesting to think about how this full movement, you know, really started with these two young girls who were probably bored in upstate New York in 1848. Um, and their sister Leah too was, um, part of, of their performance and traveling. So this emerged in the Burned Over District in upstate New York. And I briefly already talked about Swedenborg and Mesmer, but um, you know, in upstate New York, there was a lot of different kind of controversial religions popping up and experimentation. So the second great awakening was happening and we have um, these religions like Quakerism and Millerism and Mormonism emerging um, in this area. And I also really like to point out um, some fun facts about spiritualism too. It wasn't just um, people in the working and middle class that were interested, but also really notable figures such as uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, who was the wife of Abraham Lincoln would hold seances in the White House um, just to contact her dead son. Um, so again, this sense of loss um, and trying to come to terms with death um, really was on, on Victorian's minds in both America and um, and Britain as well. And so this is how spiritualism started to emerge um, in the US. And some other really great sources are um, John Kuchich's um, Ghostly Communion, um, Molly McGarry's uh, Ghosts of Futures Past, um, Bennett's Transatlantic Spiritualism in 19th Century American Literature as well, if you would like more resources with um, reading that. I also wanna talk about spiritualism in Britain. Um, so roughly in the 1850s, um, spiritualism became really popular in Britain. So um, some scholars think that the American medium, um, Maria B. Hayden visited um, London and started to perform um, seances in the public spheres of the middle and upper class um, elite of uh, England. And so spiritualism also kind of took off like wildfire as well. Um, there's actually been more scholarship written on, on British spiritualism and mediums versus American, which is a little interesting because spiritualism, you know, really started there and then went over to Britain. Um, but it seems to be a more popular movement in Britain during this time. Um, some notable uh, mediums that emerge are Florence Cook um, and uh, Madame de Esperance, as well as Emma Hardinging um, Britain, who actually moved to America and performed there. Um, and also some other fun facts where um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a huge um, proponent of spiritualism. He wrote a two volume um, book series called The History of Spiritualism, which is actually pretty good. I've, I've read some of it. And he also was part of the Ghost Club too. Um, he also was really interested in fairies, um, which some of you might know. So Doyle was a really cool guy. Um, as I mentioned, um, there was a lot of skepticism um, surrounding spiritualism, and so the Society for Cyclical Research was founded, but then an American chapter was formed in 1886. Um, so again, these, you know, some, some skeptics and um, followers of spiritualism did see it as a pseudoscience um, in some aspects, but some other people were just more interested in the spiritual side of spiritualism, um, but a lot of investigations were going on. Um, I'm actually interested in my own research of looking at how the female medium, you know, enters this power play, so to speak, um, with the male occult investigator, the cyclical researcher of how, you know, these gender dynamics were occurring um, in the seance room and how, you know, women with such limited rights during this time were trying to contest um, we're trying to, you know, contest the, these male cyclical researchers who, you know, championed rationality and science. Um, and then as another fun fact, um, Queen Victoria held many, many seances in her home. Um, she wanted to talk to Prince Albert after his death. Um, and then um, it's also rumored that Queen Victoria herself, after she died, um, gave a message um, through her spirit form to her daughter. So um, we can see that, you know, from all ranks of society, there were so many people interested in spiritualism in America and Britain. I also wanted to talk um, briefly about the women's rights movement because in my research, there 
are tons of um, female spiritualists who were proponents and advocates for women's rights. Not all, but most of them, um, especially female mediums who were emerging into the public sphere where, you know, during this time, women were mostly confined to restrictive gender roles and, you know, the private domestic sphere, but they were starting to perform in the public. Um, so in 1848, the first wave of feminism emerged in the US, which is so interesting. Um, I find it really fascinating because 30 miles away or so, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were signing um, the Declaration of Sentiments, whereas in Hydesville, New York, Cady and Maggie Fox were, you know, birthing spiritualism. So I do not say that as a coincidence at all. And I find it really fascinating, this intersection between uh, spiritualism and uh, feminism, both emerging and really having women at the center of, of each uh, movement. Um, so I just wanted to make a note of that. So now we'll just kind of briefly talk about the participants within spiritualism. Um, so from 1848 to 1860s, um, roughly, um, of course, we have the Fox sisters um, who were performing in America, um, mostly in, in uh, New York City. But um, at the beginning of spiritualism as mediums and clairvoyants um, and automatic speakers and or automatic writers and trans speakers were performing, um, they, they were mostly kind of focused on just receiving spirit messages. So a lot of table wrapping um, was happening, was happening, um, table turning, and of course, um, receiving messages from spirits through shifting letters um, during uh, performances. But also interestingly, um, uh, entering into mediumship in public performance, um, it really became more dramatic and, th and theatrical um, over the course of the 19th century. So in the 1860s to the 1880s, um, mediums such as Florence Cook were starting to perform full form materializations. And what that is, is um, a medium would literally embody a spirit. And so a spirit would then be in the physical body of the medium and go and interact with sitters, would kiss their hands, would touch them. Um, also levitation was happening and then performing um, ectoplasm to emerging from the medium. And then roughly in the 1880s and 1900s, um, and this varies of course um, in Britain and America, but mediumship and performances began to decline at the turn of the century. Of course, some um, spiritualism still occurs today. There's actually two, um, two uh, societies in the US in New York and Florida that still um, perform uh, and believe in spiritualism. Um, so typically, and I find this uh, really fascinating with the intersection of class and looking at how mediums, you know, really navigated these different uh, performances and spaces. So most mediums um, were women, um, but not all. Daniel Douglas um, Holm was a really famous American medium. But mediums were typically from the lower and working class, and they entered into the spheres and societies of middle and upper class. And I find that fascinating because we start to get, of course, you know, this these different interactions of um, a working class female interacting with an upper class, you know, uh, male, you know, follower or sitter. And um, mediumship was a really, really profitable career, especially for Victorian women who really had um, such limited, um, you know, jobs and vocations during this time as well. So the Fox sisters, um, so to kind of give a more um, background on uh, the Fox sisters and how they were the founding mothers of spiritualism. So um, in March, 1848, they heard the wrappings of a murdered peddler underneath their floorboard. They would say, knock three times, and they would hear three raps. Um, and so of course this spread to the neighborhood as well as to New York City of their amazing abilities of being able to talk with spirits and find out about this murdered peddler beneath their floorboard. Um, so they started to perform in Rochester, Hydesville is near Rochester, and then they also went to New York City. Um, and Leah Fish was their older sister and became their manager. So they had a really successful career um, but there's also a downside to spiritualism. Um, both Katie and Maggie were really bad alcoholics. They were married and then divorced and um, their significant other um, was uh, perished as well. And so in 1888 though, they confessed that their abilities were fraudulent, that they would crack their knuckles and joints to make their wrappings occur. 
Um, but then uh, interestingly, um, Katie recanted right before her death. Um, so they had a lot of notoriety, um, really successful economic career, but also wasn't really still accepted in society. Um, so of course, you know, women during this time were still really subjected to a lot of scrutiny and especially mediums. Florence Cook, um, she's just such a fascinating uh, medium to me. She, I think is really wonderful and I love studying her. So she is um, arguably the most famous British medium from this time. Um, she was from a working class background and performed for the middle and upper class. Um, she would flirt, she kissed sitters during seances, like really kind of transgressing these boundaries um, that were put on Victorian women during this time. She would, um, perform full form materializations. In particular, this, the one spirit that would emerge most of the time was Katie King, who was the daughter of the 16th century buccaneer. Um, so I find that really, really fascinating too, like how she came up um, with uh, the spirits and the background and stories. The peak of her career was roughly the 1870s as well. Um, and she is most known for entering into an affair with William Crooks, who was a, an early cyclical um, investigator and researcher. Um, he was a big proponent for her abilities, but then she was proven as a fraud later um, during a couple of tests. So she also died penniless um, at the end of her career in life. So next we also have uh, Madame de Esperance. Um, she was also a famous medium. Her real name is Elizabeth Hope, but her stage name um, was Madame D'Esperance. Um, so she also performed full form materializations and her popular spirit was Yolande. Um, what I find really interesting about her is most mediums were really um, quiet about their abilities and their performances, but um, she published an autobiography called Shadowland or Light from the Other Side um, in 1897. And she talked about how she was younger, how she saw spirits and shadows and how this has been a part of her, um, you know, throughout her entire life, not just, you know, engaging in public performances. Um, and she was also really against the, the invasive nature of the cyclical research of investigations of mediums of being tied down. Um, of being, uh, you know, tested in all these kind of really invasive ways um, was really, uh, she was really adamant and, and very against it of, you know, just believe us and our abilities. Why do we need to be probed by these male um, read, uh, researchers? Okay, so now I just gave a brief background on spiritualism, but I want to shift toward talking about um, the female Gothic ghost stories, as well as the female spiritualist too. So the female Gothic, and why I want to go over this as well too, is that I situate um, women's ghost stories um, within the tradition of the female Gothic. And so I just think it's good to kind of go over a definition in case some um, people in the audience are not quite as familiar um, with talking with um, the female Gothic. And so it is actually a very kind of um, contentious term. It's been uh, kind of contested recently in scholarship of whether or not um, it's useful to talk about, um, you know, the term female Gothic and to have female and male Gothic separated. But um, Ellen Moore's in 1976 um, published this book called Literary Women. Um, and she coined the term female Gothic. And she defines this as the work that women writers have done in the literary mode that since the 18th century we have called the Gothic. Um, so of course, in her text, she looks at uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. She argues that this text is um, a birth myth um, as well. And she also looks at Anne Radcliffe's novels too. Um, so this picture here is um, taken from, um, I think maybe the Mysteries of Udolpho or a Sicilian romance um, from Anne Radcliffe's works. Um, but what I think is so interesting and important about the female Gothic and creating this um, tradition, so to speak, and, and focus of scholarship is that these texts examine female concerns and fears that don't really appear um, in, in male authored texts, such as, you know, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, Matthew Lewis's The Monk, or even, um, you know, I guess the father of the Gothic, um, Horace Walpole's uh, The Castle of Otranto. And so in the female Gothic, in these works, um, they look at themes and fears uh, such as confinement. You know, we can see that so much um, in Anne Radcliffe's works, um, patriarchal violence and power, 
um, domestic abuse, um, trauma, such as generational trauma, psychological, emotional, physical, as well as the um, restrictions of gender roles as well. Um, so I find this um, really interesting and I, I see a lot of these um, themes and tradition emerge in women's ghost stories. So Diana Wallace has a really wonderful article of arguing that the ghost story um, is part of the female Gothic. Um, so I just wanted to read a couple of quotes off. Um, and the first was, the ghost story as a form has allowed women writers special kinds of freedom, not merely to include the fantastic and the supernatural, but also to offer critiques of male power and sexuality, which are often more radical than those in more realistic genres. So for instance, um, and some women's ghost stories, both British and American, um, you know, there might be this emergence of or this appearance of a ghost who, um, you know, appears to this male character who doesn't really kind of believe that the supernatural can, can occur or happen. And typically this ghost might, you know, be the return of the repressed of um, writing a wrongdoing that was done to perhaps um, a woman who perished, um, you know, from, um, something horrible that the man did in, um, in life. And so we kind of see um, how women's ghost stories are, again, contesting male power and sexuality and really threatening their identity and their sense of um, rationality. And so um, she further argues that, you know, the female Gothic explores deep-rooted female fears about women's powerlessness and imprisonment within patriarchy, so exclusion and abandonment. The figure of the ghost, you know, is this kind of liminal figure, not really dead, not really alive, um, and is able to transgress um, the physical realm and all those restrictions that relate to women. Um, and so the last quote I just wanted to go over to is if the Gothic is detached from the Gothic novel, however, and regarded as the mode of writing rather than a genre, then it becomes flexible enough to encompass the ghost story. And so that is where a lot of my research also focuses on too, of seeing how this um, women's ghost stories fit within the tradition of female Gothic. So women writers and the Victorian ghost story. Um, so if you're not really familiar with women's ghost stories from the Victorian and Edwardian period, I highly recommend you go um, read some today. Um, they're really wonderful. They're really, um, I feel like under, under uh, sold and not really talked about too much in literary criticism and scholarship. So um, I'm really interested in recovery work of bringing to life these um, not just forgotten about works, but these for forgotten about women who were popular during their day. For instance, Latisse Galbraith, who writes in the seance room, which is my favorite ghost story. Um, no biographical information is, is it been able to be found of her. Um, she was really popular and she published um, quite a bit of ghost stories, but unfortunately there's just not a lot of um, information on her. Um, and Rhoda Broughton's coming back um, into popularity as well. And, you know, Elizabeth Gaskell is popular and Mary E. Braddon, but for their novels. So, um, but interestingly, 70% of ghost stories that were published in the 19th century were um, mostly uh, written by women writers, both British and American magazines. Um, so I find that, that really interesting. Um, in the peak of women writers, ghost stories was between 1815 and 1880. Um, there was just the sweet spot um, between the Victorian ghost story. Um, so the ghost story was popular from 1830 to like 1910, 1920s. Um, and of course, some of the first earliest ghost stories were written by, um, uh, I think the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens is one of the first ones. Um, but women were, you know, really part of the market. Um, and interestingly, too, a lot of consumers of ghost stories were women. So, you know, we imagine these women writers writing to women readers and conveying these, you know, feelings of powerlessness as women in society. Um, so it really changes how I read these ghost stories when I think of that fact. Um, I also just love this quote. Um, Vanessa D. Dickerson has just really wonderful of uh, research um, as she looks at um, women writers of, um, you know, not just ghost stories, but also just supernatural fiction in general. Um, and so she equates, uh, you know, women writers and also mediums kind of to the ghost and this ghostliness um, of, of not having a lot of rights in society. Um, so she writes, in the seance room at the mesmeric session, but particularly in the ghost story, women could more freely and safely examine the possibilities and limitations 
of her mythical role as the angel in the house. And she could, if she chose, release those not so angelic impulses, feelings, and desires that the age publicly denied her. Victorian women's participation in the revival of supernaturalism constituted both expression and exploration of their own spirituality and their ambiguous status as the other living in a state of in-betweenness, between the walls of the house, between animal and man, between angel and demon. And so this quote just really exemplifies, again, women's in-betweenness, this state of just being um, not really here nor there, and that really does equate um, with the ghost, who is neither here nor there as well. Um, and then also points out uh, medium's abilities to this kind of intersection between the living and the dead. I also wanted to talk about how spiritualism really did impact the ghost story too, and why um, I really focus on it in my research. So in the beginning, um, when the ghost story was being formed into its own genre, um, ghost stories typically were embedded with a narrative. So one really, um, Notable example is The Bleeding Nun, the narrative of The Bleeding Nun in uh, Matthew Lewis's The Monk. Um, so we kind of have, you know, this ghost, um, this bleeding nun ghost appear to Raymond um, during the story, but it's kind of more of a side plot. So ghosts would kind of appear, they would kind of scare, you know, the characters in the stories. But as we move uh, more forward into the 19th century, ghosts have more agency. Um, they become, uh, you know, figures of retribution and revenge. They cause a lot of harm to the living. And so as ghosts and spirits themselves gained more agency within spiritualism, so too do they in the ghost story. Um, a couple of scholars have really good information on this, such as um, Jennifer Bann talks about how spiritualism does, um, in fact, uh, um, influence the ghost story. So she writes um, that the movement, sorry, the, the little screen's my way. The, the movement during the 19th century quote, contributed a new model of the ghostly to supernatural literature and influenced by the active powerful figures of the seance room, the specters of the ghost story change. Um, and, and Jeffrey Weinstock talks about um, American women uh, writers of uh, ghost stories and scare tactics, which I highly recommend. It's a wonderful book. Um, so he writes too how um, a ghostly sisterhood of dead women that warns living women about the dangers of marriage and patriarchy occur in American women writers uh, ghost stories in the 19th century. So this um, dead um, woman who is now a ghost in spirit goes and warns um, women about, you know, the dangers of marriage or the dangers of this particular male figure. This actually happens in Edith Wharton's um, uh, The Lady's Maid's Bell, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then finally, another quote from Dickerson, just because her, her work is uh, really influential. She writes, it was finally not men's, but women's ghost stories that truly treated the return of the repressed and the dispossessed. Ghost stories could provide a fitting medium for eruptions of female libidinal energy, of thwarted ambitions, of cramped egos. So again, this ghost is used and is a very useful figure for um, women in particular and women writers. Okay, so now the female spiritualist. Um, she's just so fascinating. So again, um, I, I see the women's uh, ghost stories fit within the tradition of the female Gothic, and I see this shift within the 19th century. So we have this persecuted heroine who appears in Radcliffian narratives of, you know, she tries to evade patriarchal power and control. Um, but she does remain complicit within these systems. Um, she's really passive. Um, and what Diana um, Hoveller uh, notes in Gothic Feminism, that the persecuted heroine actually promotes victim feminism, which is problematic. So as we shift into the 19th century, I see this different um, female figure emerge in these ghost stories, and that's the female spiritualist. Um, she's not particularly, um, and of course I'm talking about the fictional female spiritualist, she's not in particularly an actual medium, she doesn't publicly perform in these ghost stories, but she has spiritualistic abilities. Um, and one thing that I actually wanted to note too is, um, you know, we are familiar with famous mediums who did perform in the public sphere, but in actuality in America, in Britain, there were actually women who, um, said that they had spiritualistic abilities, but didn't really um, promote it or publicly perform. And so this is the type of figure and woman that I'm interested in looking at in these ghost stories. 
Um, so she establishes her own authority and power through occult and spiritualistic means. Um, for instance, um, as science was being professionalized and developed, women were being left out. Um, even though these doctors and researchers who were performing experiments, their wives were helping them, but they weren't even allowed to actually be credited and to be allowed to enter into the science, you know, the science fields for a long time. And so um, I see these figures going to the occult, to the supernatural as like the rational and natural worlds really deny them power and authority. Um, and, and also this figure contests patriarchal power, culture, and institutions, um, as well as, you know, types of knowledge such as Eurocentric masculinist epistemologies too. Um, and so these figures um, have uh, different skills of clairvoyance, so clairvoyant dreams, or a mediumship being able to communicate or hear spirits, um, even trans speaking or automatic writing. Okay, so now we are going to dive into um, our Victorian American and British ghost stories as well. So the first one I wanted to talk about is from Rose Terry Cook, uh, My Visitation in 1858. Um, I actually became familiar with this ghost story um, from Jeffrey Weinstock's Scare Tactics. He writes really brilliant um, insight and in looking at how queer same-sex desires depicted in this ghost story. Um, and so just to kind of give a brief um, summary of this ghost story. So um, the, the main speaker and figure of this uh, ghost story is um, an unnamed female protagonist. Um, she endures a lot of illness during her childhood and as she grows into womanhood as well. Um, and so she is an orphan. She's staying at um, her aunt and uncle's house who also taken another young woman. Her name is Eleanor Weiss. Um, so this unnamed female protagonist develops um, unrequited feelings in um, desire for Eleanor, um, who Eleanor kind of rejects her, um, doesn't really, um, isn't really nice to her, um, and just kind of one day goes off and is engaged and um, marries this other man. And so where this ghost story is taking place is that um, after Eleanor leaves, it's been several years, this female protagonist starts to develop um, spiritualistic abilities and she doesn't really understand why. So at first she's kind of ambivalent um, to having these spiritualistic abilities. And one quote that I wanted to highlight uh, really portrays this. The first time it came was in broad day. A horror of flesh and scents crept over me, but I was ashamed. I treated it with contempt. Shivering, I walked to the shelf, reached the cup, swallowed my nauseous dose, now tasteless, and went back to bed. It is not worth denying that I trembled. I am a coward. I am always afraid. Even when I face the fear, so shaking, I lay down. My throat was parched, my lips beaded with a sweat of terror but the consciousness of solitude returned in time to save me from faintness. It had gone and that was the first time. So to, to kind of unpack um, this scene, um, she, I, as we can tell is, you know, a bit ambivalent toward um, her, her abilities to sense ghosts, to sense spirits and be able to communicate with them. Um, and I wanted to highlight from Alex Owens, um, a really good argument that she makes in um, The Darkened Room is that uh, female mediums during this time um, equated, um, you know, passive passivity um, with um, power. And so actually a lot of female mediums in real life, um, both public and, and private, um, developed their spiritual stick abilities through illness. Um, and so um, it was thought that women who, um, you know, were more mild-mannered and meek um, could uh, be a better vessel of communicating with spirits and ghosts as well. And so illness actually is equated with, with gaining this power of being able to communicate with spirits. Um, and I just wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, so at the end of the ghost story, um, she has this spirit following her. She's not really understanding how, and mostly enc she encounters it within the space of the bedroom, which I think is really interesting too. Um, and then she later finds out that Eleanor dies. And this is Eleanor's spirit who is trying to communicate with her, um, trying to reach out to her in the ghostly realm um, of, you know, mistreating her. And of course, um, also um, loving her as well. 
And so I see that the ghostly transgresses the limitations in the material to happening. Um, this taboo same-sex desire in, in Victorian society no longer um, really impedes Eleanor's ghost who doesn't have to abide by um, Victorian societal um, restrictions. And so at the end of this ghost story too, um, the female protagonist embraces her spiritualistic abilities to be able to be in communion uh, with Eleanor again. Um, I could see nothing, but I felt that something yearning, restless, pained and sad regarded me. I began to gain courage. I began to pity a soul that had cast off life yet could not die to life. And now it drew nearer as if some magnetism born of my kindlier sympathies melts the barrier between us close, closer till something rustled like a light touched the cover of my bed, stirred at my ear. Good heaven, could I bear that? And so another also um, that this ghost story highlights um, is that female mediums were sympathetic beings. Um, and so they gained these spiritualistic powers um, because of their sympathy, because of their willingness to communicate and help out um, a troubled spirit. All right, so the next one is Madeline Vinton Dahlgren's um, The Woodley Lane Ghost. Um, this is a really, really fun um, ghost story. I found it in um, just a random uh, Victorian ghost story collection that I bought. Um, just because it's kind of hard to go down the rabbit hole and find these ghost stories. So I just bought all these books off Amazon um, and I would go down rabbit holes of research and try to find more ghost stories. And I found this and I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, so just to give a summary of this too, um, this is an American writer, just like Rose Terry Cook. And um, the, the story uh, focuses around um, a doctor, a young male doctor named Dr. Rao and his wife, Cynthia. Um, they encounter this mystical cult man called Java Alim, um, who bequeaths his house because he is dying to them. And so he has this occult power um, and he wants to bequeath it to them. So they move into this house um, and the doctor um, who it's, it doesn't really say what type of doctor he was, but um, he starts to become fascinated by the occult. And he's reading this library and grabbing all these sources and books. But his wife, um, Cynthia, starts to develop these spiritualistic powers and she enters into trans speaking. Um, so what I see happening in this ghost story is, um, you know, how this uh, male uh, medical gaze and power is being um, contested by this spiritualistic female power as well. Um, so I will read uh, a snippet of how Cynthia starts to develop her powers. To her morbid imagination, the rude blasts of the wind had human voices that sighed, moaned, groaned, wailed, howled, and shrieked. And during the blackness of the long winter nights, all these voices of nature were a thousandfold intensified to her acute perceptions. One thing Cynthia became aware of, only her ears were open to these preternatural sounds. She had, it is true, an increasing consciousness that they might be evoked at any time. So again, we see this, you know, supernatural occult um, woman gaining these powers. Um, and throughout this ghost story, she's belittled by her husband. She is treated, um, he infantilizes her. He treats her like a child. He calls her moonflower, um, which of course is a symbol of how um, a flower blossoms overnight and then dies by the morning. And so we see a lot of, you know, this kind of power play happening. And so by the end of um, the ghost story, Cynthia has the power to bring back the Java Align back alive. And her husband isn't really sure how to kind of stop or kind of, um, or stop or inhibit her power. And so her supernatural mesmeric gaze starts to become much more powerful. Um, and in the scene too, which I find really um, compelling is that um, that if she gazed upon him when his willpower was relaxed, it might infuse some mesmeric state not well for him. So she's really, um, really aware of her power. Um, but then at the end, she actually causes her husband's death. Um, so she kind of overtakes him and overcomes him. She did not see Albright or seeing he did not. With the palms of her thin hands closely pressed against the blue vein temples, the large orbs of her wide opened eyes gazing fixedly, she stood in speechless affright. Um, so again, this um, occult supernatural woman who's kind of ambivalent in the beginning of the story to her abilities embraces them. Um, and she can test her husband's patriarchal male gaze and power. All right, so now we'll shift to two 
um, of my favorite um, ghost stories written by British women writers. Um, Rhoda Brown is just, I love her so much. Um, I first read Cometh Up as a Flower when I was an undergrad and I just couldn't get away from her. Um, so one of my favorite ghost stories that she writes is Behold, It Was a Dream in 1872. Um, to give a brief background on this one too, um, so Dinah Ballers is this Irish spinster um, who goes to visit her friend Jane in the Irish countryside. So Jane um, got married older, now she is a wife. Um, and so Dinah goes in and stays at her house. But while she's sleeping in her bedroom, she has this terrible clairvoyant dream that her, both Jane and her husband are going to be murdered and they're in bed. But they both um, laugh it off and don't believe her. Um, but by the end of the story, sorry for spoilers too, um, but by the end of the story, um, they are both killed in their marital bed. So of course, um, like the other two stories, Dinah is a little bit a little bit ambivalent at the beginning um, about her spiritual stick ability. She kind of doubts herself, even though um, there of course is a lot of good reasoning to listen to her. So she uses her spiritual stick abilities to challenge the patriarchal dominance of Weston House um, when she encounters bad dreams in her bedroom. So as the spinster, she's kind of this figure of otherness entering in the, into the domestic sphere. She's neither a wife nor a mother. Um, and so she already is kind of this, um, besides her spiritual stick abilities, this other that is um, entering this domestic sphere and kind of destabilizing it, so to speak. Um, so she dreams of Jane and her husband, um, Robin uh, Watson, dead, lying, murdered, and drowned in their own blood. And what I find also um, intriguing, too, is she uses her clairvoyant abilities to um, really convey her anxiety of the bedroom, um, the space of the bedroom, but also how the bedroom signifies women's sexual repression and the potential of encountering psychological and physical trauma. So um, she notes that there's a slash across Jane's throat. Um, in her dream as a huge and yawning gash and gash can be um, a, you know, a colloquial term for vagina as well during this time. So this is really showing um, Dinah's anxiety of sexual oppression and, and abuse. Um, and so by the end of the novel, she really does embrace um, her clairvoyant premonition, um, believes in it, and she reads in the newspaper that they were murdered in their bed. Um, so we see again, the female spiritualist really encounter these skeptics such as um, Jane and her husband, and then in the end, um, being the one who, who knew the most um, and who had this power to you know, stop them from being murdered, but it wasn't heated. So we also have Edith Nesbitt's The Ebony Frame. Um, oops, sorry about that. I try to move the Zoom bar because it's hard to read the quotes. Um, so Edith Nesbitt um, was really famous for actually um, writing children's stories, but she wrote tons and tons and tons of uh, ghost stories, and they're all really creepy. And this one comes from Grim Tales, I believe. Um, so background on this ghost story is um, there is the nameless... Um, a lot of these characters are nameless and I kind of don't understand why, um, but the nameless uh, male narrator of this um, ghost story uh, inherits uh, his aunt's um, old house and so he moves into it and he finds this um, portrait um, of this beautiful woman in this ebony frame. And so he uncovers, the, the picture is dirty, so he um, uncovers it, cleans it up, and he finds this beautiful black velvet woman in this black velvet dress. Um, and so he wishes her to be a live woman, even though he's courting this woman in Mildred. So this woman comes alive in this picture. Um, she was able to, as a spiritualist woman, um, uh, keep herself from um, perishing forever by putting her ghost and spirit to this portrait. So um, they were apparently lovers about 200 years prior, and she um, uh, made a deal with the devil that she would, um, if she could be reunited with her with her lover, that she would give her soul away and kind of keep her existence alive in this ebony frame. Um, so this male narrator um, is like, I don't understand why, but I know I do love her and we're from a different lifetime. But then um, <clears throat> Mildred gets really um, jealous and burns down the house and also burns um, the picture of the woman in the ebony frame. And so he um, ends up marrying Mildred, but always is longingly thinking about this um, female spiritualist. 
So what's interesting about this um, ghost story is that um, it shows the the plight of Victorian women. It doesn't it doesn't have a happy ending for this female spiritualist, um, but it does show how she's mistreated in society um, and just how women have a lack of rights and autonomy. Mildred is also treated really terribly um, as well in this. <clears throat> excuse me, in this ghost story. Um, so I just wanted to read a quote from um, the Black Velvet Woman um, from this ghost story. I'm a ghost, I suppose, she said, laughing softly, and her laughter stirred memories, which I just grasped at and just missed. But you and I know better, don't we? I will tell you everything you have forgotten. We loved each other, ah. Uh, no, you have not forgotten that. And when you came back from the wars, we were to be married. Our pictures were painted before you went away. <clears throat> You know, I was more learned than women of that day. Dear when, when you were gone, they said I was a witch. They tried me. They said I should be burned. Just because I had looked at the stars and gained more knowledge than other women, they must needs bind me to a stake and let me be eaten by the fire and you far away. Um, and then also during this time too, and I, I love to highlight this, is that, um, you know, female spiritualists were equated to um, being witches and to doing witchcraft. And so... Um, this protagonist has this power. Um, she's more learned than other women and men in her day, and she is tried for it. And unfortunately, um, Nesbitt's ghost story depicts the plight of um, female spiritualists in their power in society of being um, subjected to ridicule and, um, and harm. All right, and now we will end with two Edwardian American and British ghost stories. So Edith Wharton's The Lady Maid's Bell. Um, this is arguably one of her best ghost stories. It's really wonderful. So in this ghost story, um, Hartley is um, a maid, a new maid of this uh, rich, um, younger, but um, in ill health um, woman named Mrs. Brimpton. Um, and so again, just like in um, Rose Terry Cook's uh, My Visitation, she develops these spiritualistic abilities after an illness. Um, so during this ghost story, um, the, the house is kind of, has a really gloomy, uh, gloominess to it and it, it feels really unsafe and unsettled. And that is because of the patriarchal presence of Mr. Brimpton, who's this alcoholic, violent man. Um, and even this ghost story alludes to um, sexual um, trauma uh, as Mr. Brimpton and Mrs. Brimpton um, are in, of course, the marital bed together. And so Hartley, um, really admires Mrs. Brimpton, feels really bad for her state as being um, in ill health and also in this really violent, toxic marriage. And so um, she starts to see the spirit of Emma Saxon, who was um, Mrs. Brimpton's old maid um, for 20 years, very devoted to her. So the ghost of Emma Saxon and Hartley work together um, to combat patriarchal violence and oppression, which is in the form of Mr. Brimpton. Um, so Hartley uses this again to, to really um, help Mrs. Brimpton to give her her own power, even though she is kind of powerlessness in this role as being a Victorian wife or Edwardian wife. Um, so when Hartley first sees Emma Saxon spirit, she, she thinks, I don't know how long she stood there. I only know I couldn't stir or take my eyes from her. Afterward, I was terribly frightened, but at the time it wasn't fear I felt, but something deeper and quieter. She looked at me long and long and her face was just one dumb prayer to me. But how in the world was I to help her? Suddenly she turned and I heard her walk down the passage. This time I wasn't afraid to follow. I felt that I must know what she wanted. So again, she's at first really ambivalent to having these powers, um, but then embraces them and helps Mrs. Brimpton um, overcome uh, her husband and his patriarchal abuse. And then lastly, um, we have Bithia Mary Croker's um, The Red Bungalow. Um, oops, sorry. So in this ghost story, um, it's not as much well known. I actually found this in um, Melissa Edmondson's um, second collection of women's weird tales, and it's really fascinating and good. Um, so Kroger herself lived in India. Um, she lived in the British Raj, I believe. Um, and so this ghost story is based in India um, with British officers and their families living um, at a station. So the unnamed uh, female uh, protagonist is the cousin-in-law of a British officer and his family who moves to um, Kulu. And so they are trying to look for this house and the wife in particular is like, I need my own domestic sphere. I need my own space. And so she finds this house called um, the Red Bungalow. And um, 
locals warn that it is haunted. It is built upon the ruins of a temple. Um, there's a lot of evil that lurks there and that she shouldn't move. Um, and then the, the um, female narrator is a spiritualist woman herself and she feels um, the ghostliness and the sense of, um, of evil that's there. And so in this passage, she writes, as I stood um, reflecting thus, gazing absently into the outer glare, a dark and mysterious cloud seemed to fall upon the place. The sun was suddenly obscured and from the portico came a sharp little gust of wind that gradually increased into a long drawn wailing cry, surely the cry of some lost soul. And so she, you know, hears the spirit and kind of senses it and knows that something is unhappy. What's also interesting is that she notes that she's Scottish um, and she's um, a Highlander. And so that she has um, predis predispositions to um, kind of feeling these spirits. Um, and so she also says, um, no, I do not like it. There's something about it that repels me. You know, I'm a Highlander and I'm sensitive to impressions. I'm sure you think I'm ignorant, superstitious, imbecile, but I believe in presentiments. I have a presentiment, dear, about that bungalow. And so again, um, you know, she she feels that something is off, but um, the wife does not heed her warning, and it um, then ends really, really tra tragically. And um, a child dies in the house, and then they move back away to um, England. Then, of course, we can um, you know tell that the spirit and evil is probably you know the return of the repressed of colonization um, in India as well. And so there's a lot going on here. But what I think is notable is that, um, you know, this female spiritualist kind of has to like live with um, people not believing her of having this communication with the spirit um, and there are consequences for it. All right, so just some concluding remarks. Um, so I, there are great scholars, um, scholarship and criticism on spiritualism, but as well as the female medium herself, but I find it still a little bit um, understudied um, within literary criticism. So I'm really interested in just kind of um, studying this more and hopefully maybe uh, writing a book on it one day. If you are interested more in female mediums, Marlene Trump's um, Altered States, uh, Sex, Nation, Drugs, and Self-Transformation and Victorian Spiritualism is a wonderful book to read. Really, really great. She goes into how a lot of mediums were um, drug addicts and alcoholics, um, and again, how they um, kissed and flirted and kind of transgressed uh, sexual morality. Um, also, I'm really just interested in just recovery work to shed light in these forgotten um, ghost stories, supernatural tales, um, as well as the authors too. And so, um, that's what's great about studying these occult tales that are kind of lesser read and lesser known. And then also, um, I'm just interested in highlighting the importance and impact of uh, the real life and fictional female spiritualist um, in uh, Victorian and Edwardian American and British culture. And just to see how, you know, spiritualism really had this, had this huge um, impact on, on these, not just ghost stories, but also other types of supernatural and occult fiction. So that is it for me today. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, I hope um, you learned some interesting stuff today and I'm excited to chat with you all in the Q&A.